It's been a tough year for Paramount stock, down over 24% year to date, down over 40% the last six months. Let's recap a little bit. We've had a dividend cut. We've had bad numbers on ad revenue. Paramount Plus, which they've been investing a lot of money into, still taking some losses there. Haven't quite turned the corner on profitability. They have some debt on their balance sheet, which in an in a higher interest rate environment doesn't always make investors super comfy. And of course, yeah, the stock price has been in a bit of a free fall, a little bit of a tailspin, as it were. So is this undervalued? Is it is it a trap? Are, are we worried? Well, let's give some counterpoints, okay? Berkshire has a pretty substantial stake in Paramount. Their cost basis is in, roughly in the 30s. Now, full disclosure, I have shares of Paramount. I also have outstanding options, uh, positions, sold puts, sold calls, things like that. My cost basis on my shares is in the mid-teens, so I got like basically a 50% discount on what Berkshire paid, and at these prices, I feel it's an even better value, okay? And I'll tell you why. Eight and a half billion dollar market cap. For what they bring to the table, I think it starts to look cheap. Let's recap some of their brands. Okay. CBS. So yeah, they've got you know late time talk, late night talk shows, all of Star Trek, just all of Star Trek, no big deal. F- five decades plus of really really popular nerd culture content with fanatical fans, fanatical. Okay. The debate between Star Wars and Star Trek uh, diehard fans has been going on since time immemorial, basically ever since both existed. Comedy Central, for those of you that want your two decades plus of South Park content, they've got that. How many decades worth of MTV content do you have? Talk about nostalgia, right? They've got, of course, Nickelodeon. 20, isn't it like 20 years now Spongebob's been around? I I remember seeing it a long time ago. I I don't know exactly how long Spongebob's been running. But Spongebob's big with the kids. And of course, Nickelodeon has the stuff I grew up with in the 90s. Um, They've probably got like Rugrats. um, uh, Maybe Ah Real Monsters, the Angry Beavers, Cat Dog, like all that kind of stuff. Maybe Ren and Stimpy. Like... I just, classic Nickelodeon was a big chunk of my childhood. And of course, we've got Showtime. So we're talking about Ray Donovan, Homeland, Dexter. Everybody loves Dexter. Everybody's favorite killer, Vigilante. Um, Billions, for those of you that like your FU money but find a succession to be a little bit too highbrow, okay? They've got, of course, um, Bellator for the MMA fans, all right? When I see all of this, I just think, okay, oh, Paramount Pictures. So they've got TV, movie theaters, so they've got the box office, the television for the ad revenue, and they've got streaming with Paramount Plus, okay? They've got the entertainment trifecta going there, all right? And I think that that makes a pretty compelling combination, especially as they get, you know, potentially more efficient with streaming going on. Maybe the recession stuff passes at some point. Recessions tend to pass eventually. Ad revenue comes back. You start to see a case, okay? Now, 
analyst projections for Paramount are, well, they look pretty good for the next three years, okay? All right, so yeah, we acknowledged earlier 2023 has been absolute ass, all right? But right now, they're trading for 10 or 11 times the 2024 earnings projection, okay? And that's... It's a pretty realistic projection, more than likely. It's it's a year out, right? Um, I don't think that's I don't think that's necessarily analysts putting the cart before the horse or anything. I think that's probably a pretty realistic number. Okay, it's even less than their twenty twenty two number, which wasn't great. I, I think we can probably, you know, give them credit for that. But what's really interesting is this twenty twenty six number. If they were to achieve this 2026 number, they would be right now trading at like four to four and a half times their 2026 projected earnings. What kind of return would you get on that? It's a crazy number, okay? But I acknowledge that 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 one that one could be you know that could be a little bit high right these are analysts they are not prophets okay they're not oracles they're not um they don't have a crystal ball this is just what they think okay but if you did plug that 2026 number in Assume that their balance sheet stays about the same, which, by the way, they have positive tangible book value. So even though they do have debt, they have tangible assets that outweigh it. So cash, plants, properties, equipment, and other such uh, assets. Um, So this excludes goodwill and intangibles, which I'll get back to that in a minute. So if you took the 2026 numbers from the analyst projections for granted... And then said, okay, but now growth suddenly just dropped straight back down to 5% for EPS. To get it to today's price, you would have to discount it by 40%. So that would be your annual return from there. 40%. That's absolutely bananas. All right? Absolutely bananas. Now, you can come up with a projection using the 2024 or 2025 numbers that makes it look more like, you know, a $20 fair value or something like that, right? But my point is, I think Buffett or whoever at Berkshire decided to buy Paramount saw something. Another thing I want to just briefly bring up is is the balance sheet, okay? Because the tangible book value that we accounted for in the model there basically completely ignores goodwill and intangibles. Basically says these exist, but they're worthless for the purposes of this pricing model. Now, I'm of two minds about that. I would say, well, first of all, just to tell you what goodwill is. Goodwill is when a company buys another company but pays more than the value of the assets on their balance sheet, the markup on those assets goes on the acquiring company's balance sheet as goodwill, right? So basically you're saying the company doesn't have this much, this many assets, but we think it's worth this much more because of whatever, because of the growth prospects, the synergy, the future, the future profits that that um, that that other company that they're acquiring will produce, and you know this can be written off in the event that um, the acquisition doesn't work out, and um, you know the assets end up not producing what they expected it to produce, and they you know they reassess the value of it and crunch it down as and take it as a loss, but. At the moment, we're not factoring this into the value at all. And I would argue that there is probably something of value in here, okay? What that what that exact number is, it's very hard to figure out, okay? 
And I'm not going to sit here and say that I know the exact number, but I, I just really think at today's valuation, Paramount offers a certain, I don't know, a, a lot of ways to win is what I want to say. So personally, I'm happy holding on to my Paramount at these prices. Um, I'll continue selling options, probably some more puts, maybe some more calls. I'm okay getting assigned more shares. I think that um, better days are ahead for the stock price in all likelihood. And of course, for the business as a whole uh, in terms of their bottom line. But hey, that's just what I think. Let me know in the comments down below what you think of Paramount. Let me know if you own any shares. And as always, like and subscribe. Join the Discord. Link in the description. Also, check us out live every Saturday. Cashflow Kings. Link in the description there, too. Take it easy, everyone. Have a chill Sunday.